here to be a part of what God is doing at Reach Church this morning. Whether you are here every week or this is your first time, we sincerely hope that while you're here, you guys feel like more than guests, that you feel like you're a part of God's family and what God is doing here is pretty special and it's amazing that we get to be a part of it. I also want to welcome everybody watching online. Let me invite you to grab your Bible and turn to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. We've been here since February, the first Sunday in February. Crazy. But it's been an amazing journey. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to raise your hand this morning and allow one of our ushers to bring you a Bible. And this Bible is a gift. It's yours to have and to keep. Our encouragement is that each week you bring your Bible, that you have something to write on and write with, and follow along as we journey through God's Word together. And as you begin to notice observations and applications and repetitions and where God is speaking to your heart, so that you can use this also throughout the week to continue your study. First Samuel is really a book comprised of historical narratives of four key characters, Eli, Samuel, Saul, and David. Now, we've seen the life and the journey of Eli early on. If you haven't had a chance to watch these sermons, you can go all the way back on our YouTube page or our, our, our website, and you can check out all of the, the messages that we've given previously leading up to today. We've looked at Eli's life, his call, his fall, the introduction of Samuel, dedication, life given to the Lord, and then we've seen this theocracy move to a democracy where the nation of Israel has moved away from God as their ultimate authority and their, their leader, their king. And they're, they're calling out that, that they would have a king like all the surrounding nations. And so they've got this dynastic monarchy that begins with a guy named Saul. And today, as we've seen throughout the, the life and the journey of Saul, we're going to see continued his ultimate demise. Today we see that the kingdom is torn away from Saul. I want to encourage you as you turn to 1 Samuel 15 to think about the title of today's topic, the title of today's sermon, the title of today's message, and that is this, volatile value, volatile value. I want to ask this question up front, where do you find your value? And now I want to preface it with this, that over the last couple of weeks, I've had amazing conversations with a really good friend of mine who is a financial planner. I've never had an interest in the stock market or mutual funds, or any of those sorts of things until recently. I just began to learn a little bit about it. And I studied, like many of you, in home economics back when I was in high school. Had to do it as part of a class. In fact, we actually learned how to write checks back then. We had a check register, and you had the carbon copy you'd go through, and you'd keep track of all the checks you were writing, and the, the, the deposits, and the withdrawals, and all of that. So a part of what we did back then was we would pull out the, the Sunday newspaper, and we would pick different stocks, and we identify them by their ticker, their, their title. But I never paid much attention to it until the last couple of weeks. I've taken an interest in it, just wanting to learn a little bit more about it and kind of just investigate a little bit more. So I started to have this conversation with a friend of mine a, a few weeks ago. And in particular, we've been talking about the amazing rise of the Ford stock that is going to continue to rise. Because Ford continues to innovate and does what no other company does. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. As I was talking to my friend, I asked this question. I said, what makes the stock market work? What makes it rise and fall? You've got these two terms. The market is either bullish or bearish. And he began to explain, well, a bull, the way the bull works is it dips its head and it comes up. And the way that a bear works is it takes its paws and it attacks down. And so it describes the trends of the market. And I asked even further, I said, so what are some of the variables that bring value to different stocks? And he said, well, that's interesting. There's a lot of different things that it could be. It could be the political prowess of the times. It could be foreign policies. It can be market psychology. It can be uh, supply and demand. It can be a rumor mill, things that are going on. It can be profit and loss statements. It could be dividends. It could be, and he started using all these big words. And so I then looked at him and I started telling him about wrestling moves. And he just looked at me like I was an idiot. And I said, exactly. I'll talk to you in common language if you talk to me in common language. And so we just began to continue this conversation. But it was amazing to me. As I listened to my friend and as I began to research even more, the amount of individuals that have placed their entire net worth in the stock market. And there's different levels of assertiveness. You can have a low end, middle end, or high end. You could be super aggressive or super conservative. Countless dollars have been made And countless dollars have been lost in the stock market. People have actually given their lives, committed suicide because of the downturn of a market. This is the danger 
when we assign all of our value into things of the world, things that are volatile at best. As I began to watch the market this last week, I saw where many stocks were on Monday and where they were on Friday, it opened and closed, and just the change, the shift in the dynamics over the days, the weeks, the months, and even up to years. I was looking at the ticker tape for, for five years. You can actually chart some of these things, and some of these IPOs that come out, I don't even know what IPO stands for. Somebody's going to tell me, what does IPO stand for? <laughs> yeah, what Sean said. And so... They start off at $30 a share, and they drop all the way down to $1.13 and all of these different things. And now introduced to the market is this cryptocurrency, Dogecoin and Ethereum and all these other things. And it's just crazy. It's crazy how people will lose their minds over these things and, and over something that is so volatile. And they'll do it based on speculative reports. Do you know what I'm talking about? They'll actually look at experts in the field that are going to give speculation as to what they think the market's going to do based on history and how history repeats itself and based on the politics and the wars and the, 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 the supply and demand and what's going on all over the place. But it's speculative at best. And people are literally betting their, their livelihoods on these speculative reports. These things are incredibly volatile. And yet I would argue that I think all too often we as individuals, we actually live this way in our lives. We look at the patterns of the world around us. We listen to the things that people are saying. We observe how they dress. We watch what they post on social media. We sit back and we study how they interact relationally with other people. And then we ask for advice. We lean into people. We allow a gateway into our lives where we invite people to speak into our lives advice, speculative advice. Sometimes it's wisdom and other times it's, it's winsome. But here's what I know is that as long as we are placing our value on the things of this world or people's opinions, our lives will always be volatile at best. And we're going to see that today as we study 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse 24. Now listen, typically we, we do a word-for-word -word study of the Bible. Today we're going to do that, but I am going to introduce a second passage of Scripture almost out of the gate that we want to look at together collectively. So find 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, and we're going to study through 35. But I also want you to take your finger and I want you to turn almost to the very end of your Bible to the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. If you don't know where Hebrews is, you can turn at the very, very, very end of your Bible and turn, start turning to your left and you'll find it. Or you can find it in the table of contents at the beginning. But we're going to spend just a little bit of time in Hebrews as we compare and contrast the volatile value that we find in the standards of this world to those who are chasing long after Christ. Lord, now as we enter into a time of publicly reading your word and studying your scripture, I pray that each one of us would study to show ourselves approved. I pray that the words of my mouth today and that the meditations of our hearts collectively would be received as a gift holy and pleasing to you alone. As your word goes out, may it not return void. Father, I pray that each and every person in this place and watching online today, whether they're watching live now or they're going to go back and watch it later, that as your word goes out, that they will encounter you, Holy Spirit, and that every life will be changed forever. Help us today to walk away with a newfound understanding of our identity and that we can be sure of who we are because of whose we are. And I pray all this in the mighty and the powerful and the ever-present name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. Amen. Amen. All right. 1 Samuel 15, beginning in verse 24. We left off in 23 last week. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I've sinned. I've disobeyed the instructions and the Lord's command, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Let's start by backtracking a little bit. It says, then Saul admitted to Samuel. What did he admit? Well, previously, if you look just a little bit above this, you'll see that the Lord has followed through on his promise all the way back with Moses and Aaron when they came under attack by the Amalekites, this group of pirates that were nomadic, that were taking advantage of everybody around them. And God promised in that time that he would annihilate, that he would wipe out the Amalekites from the face of the earth, that there would be no remnant left of the people. Through Saul and the nation of Israel, God wanted to fulfill his promise. And so he, he had a, a command that he gave Saul, and that was to round up his troops and go and fight and demolish the Amalekites, killing everything and everyone. Saul went to war, but was, was, was so enamored with cultural and, 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 and cultural norms at the time that he didn't follow through entirely on God's command and commission on his life. Yeah, he did in part, 
But the Bible says that he spared King Agag as a trophy and that he spared the best of the livestock and the best of the goods. And his excuse was, I did this so that I could give it to God. And Samuel says, you know what? Disobedience or, or, or half obedience is entire disobedience. What God desires isn't your burnt offerings and sacrifices. What God desires wholly is obedience. And we left off yesterday with four words and a new understanding that obedience is our success. That there are metrics and fruit of the success, but ultimately when it comes to following Jesus, that obedience to his word, his will, and his way in our lives is where we find our success. So now on the heels of that, Saul concedes. He says, I admit to Samuel based on the facts that have been presented before him. Yeah, I admit, Samuel, I've sinned. Now sinning is literally an injustice against God. It's a wrong against God. It's an act of disobedience against God. There are sins of omission and sins of commission. In this case, Saul had committed both. He says, I, I've sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. Now pay attention and underline or highlight or italicize this reason that he gives. For I was afraid of the people and I did what they demanded. Rather than being concerned with his convictions of what the Lord had called him to, he was consumed with popularity and what the people had to say about him. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And let's spend some time investigating what happens when we care more about, when we care more about what people around us think than the call of God on our lives. The book of Hebrews, the author is unknown. The audience is likely the Hebrew people that speak the Gentile language or that, that speak Greek. And as they go through this, there are several key points of emphasis through the book of Hebrews. What I love is if you read Hebrews chapter one, I would encourage you to go back and study it on your own. Every single song that we sang this morning, all three of them can be found theologically and doctrinally in Hebrews one. About the name of Jesus, about the radiance of God's glory, about his being, about the power that comes with the name of Jesus and about how we interact with our great God. At the end of Hebrews chapter 13 is this compare and contrast about the ways of the world and about the ways of those who call themselves followers of Christ. And I want to read to you some of the closing remarks of this letter intended to the Hebrew people, beginning in verse one. We're going to read all the way through verse 17 and I'm going to backtrack for a moment. We're going to study this. Chapter 13, verse 1, the author writes, Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I would encourage you to commit that to memory, Hebrews 13, 8. Circle, highlight, underline, italicize that. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday as he is today and as he forever will be. Verse 9. So don't be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food which don't help those who follow them. We have an altar from which the priests in the tabernacle have no right to eat. And under the old system, the old covenant, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin. And the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. This was just a temporary. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy, set apart by means of his own blood. The final atonement, once and for all, for all. Verse 13, so let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. Praise God. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Amen. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. 
These are the sacrifices that please God. To do good and to share with those in need. In verse 17, we round out this, this part of this chapter. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. So flip back to Hebrew, or excuse me, 1 Samuel 15 and ask yourself this question. Why would an author write something so poignant to an audience? Why would someone give these words of wisdom with so much intention and specificity? What's going on? It can only mean one thing when you address something as intentional and as deliberate, yet as broad as what's going on here. And that is that there must be a counterpart to this kind of living. This letter is a reminder to the nation of Israel. This letter is a continual reminder about the characteristics of a Christian, of those who follow Jesus Christ. This letter demonstrates and points out 12 unique qualities and character traits of a follower of Jesus and the responsibilities that come from following Christ. The reason that they would point out all each, or each and every one of these 12 characteristics is because the, the, the opposite end of this spectrum are those that do not follow these things. And let's investigate the ways of the world because that's what's going on. The nation of Israel at the time that the Hebrew letter is written, around A.D. 70, they're being persecuted because of their faith. This is right before the fall of the temple. They're being persecuted. They're being wrongfully arrested. They're being put to death. They're being martyred for their faith. They're being challenged in every way. They're losing their jobs. They're losing their loved ones. They're being forced as exiles to live outside of their own communities, having to adopt cultures that are not consistent with their own. There's a lot that's taking place according to the, according to the standards of the world. So let's look at 12 characteristics, 12 dangers of obeying the ways of the world. I'm going to put them up on the screen for us. Here they are. In, in a way that is consistent with what we just read, these are the inverse of the 12. You see, the dangers of the patterns of the world are that we become self-absorbed or that we become greedy or that we, bec we, we, we look for friends with benefits. And it's not what you're thinking. I don't mean male-female relationship. Friends with benefits, that's taking advantage of any relationship you can for your own benefit or your own gain. That's your filter. Self-preservation is a pattern of the world. Flippant view of marriage is a pattern of the world. And self-indulgence is a, is a pattern of the world. Dismissive of accountability Pursuant of the latest trends and fads, model the behaviors of the world, idol worship, neglectful of the needy, a disregard of any godly authority. These right here are the patterns of the world. We see this every single day. We see a blue and a red fighting over these principles and practices every minute of every day the world over. And it's beginning to infiltrate churches the world over. So these are things that we need to be aware of so that we know how to respond as fully committed followers of Christ. So let's, let's examine again. I just read this text to you, Hebrews 13, 1 through 17, in the narrative. In other words, I, I read it without breaking it up to examine, but I want to talk about the 12 points that you can find highlighted throughout Hebrews 13, 1 through 17. The opposite of being self-absorbed. Let's go ahead and look at these. Love for one another in verse 1. Hospitable in verse 2. Instead of friends with benefits, it's intentionally thinking of the persecuted. Instead of looking at people and what they can give to you or what value add they have to your lives, it's looking at those around you and asking God how you can be of value to their lives, how you can benefit them. Instead of self-preservation, it's care for those being mistreated. The orphans, the widows, the misrepresented, the misplaced, the mistreated, Instead of a flippant view of marriage, it's honoring your marriage. It's being consistent with the vows that you exchange before God and the witnesses that you've assembled. Instead of self-indulgence, it's not loving money. In fact, Scripture says don't love money. It's the exact opposite. Don't love money. Be content with what you have. And my question to each and every one of us to reflect on right now is if there was not another thing added to our lives other than Christ and Him alone, is that enough? If not, then the scripture says that what we're doing is called idol worship. Dismissive of accountability. A behavior of a Christ follower is somebody who welcomes spiritual accountability. 
Last week I said at the close of our time together that there is tremendous value in generations and that the older generations, the saints of our Savior should be modeling this behavior and mentoring younger individuals. And I said of younger generations that we should be looking to the, to the matriarchs and patriarchs of the faith and asking them to be to be our mentors, that we would be accountable to them. And I was standing in the lobby at the end of the service, and I saw this young man walk out, and he spoke loud enough. He said, look, the pastor just said that you guys offer accountability partners here. I want one. But praise God. Praise God that there was action in the message that they were moved to have accountability in somebody mentoring and modeling the life of Christ in their lives. Pursuant of the latest trends and fads or patterns of the world, but we are called to stay grounded in the gospel. What is the gospel? It is the good news. Jesus Christ and him alone. That is the gospel. There's nothing that we should add to or take away from. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith through grace so that none of us can boast. And so we need to stay grounded in the gospel, not pursuant of the latest trends and fads. The world says that we need to model the behaviors of the world, what they drive, where they live, what they vacation, how they spend their money, how they spend their time, what they do on social media. When the word of God tells us that we are to actively pursue Jesus. The world says that we should worship the idols around us. Now they won't come out and, and say it as overt as that. They won't say, look, every one of us should have idols that we worship. But they'll lead the way in that. And that they'll worship things of this world with their time, their treasure, and their talents. When the word of God says that we should worship God and him alone. The world says that we should be neglectful of the needy. In fact, the world has created a calloused heart in us that will look at those on the side of the road or will look at those who are less than, that are unemployed, or will look at those in the social welfare system and we will literally throw shade on them without knowing their story, without knowing their history, without knowing their background, without knowing their mental state, without knowing their family support, without knowing any kind of a structure that they have. We will literally look at somebody and we will assign value on them. And we will, we will neglect them and say, you know what, to each his own. You want some money? Go get a job. But what the word of God calls us to do is to do good to those in need. And the only way you can actually determine someone's need is if you take the time to get to know them. Invest in their lives. One of the most precious, beautiful Stories that I can ever give you is a story that I learned from my son almost 14 years ago. I'm going to say something that's going to blow your mind. I was playing indoor soccer. <laughs> we got done with soccer and we went down the street to McDonald's. That didn't blow your mind. The soccer did. And we sat down to eat. And as we were all eating, this man walked in and he told us that he was outside with his family and he asked us to buy him food. He said, I've got my four kids and we're out of money. We're just trying to make our way to wherever their destination was. And he, he didn't ask for money. He just said, would you please help me buy food? And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out $3. And I said, here you go. And you know what ran through my mind? Liar. Get a job. You're just going to go spend this on booze. You're going to waste my time. I, I, I don't have time for this. Did I mention I was pastoring at the time? <laughs> yeah, okay. It was a church league I was playing indoor soccer with. And as a man went about his way, I, I turned right back to my whatever I was eating at the time. I didn't pay attention to him. And my son Caden got up from his seat and he walked over to my, to my leg right here and he leaned against me and he said, Daddy, why can't we help his family? And I said, Pally, what do you mean? And he said, Daddy, he says he has a family, they're hungry. And I turned over my shoulder and he was ordering three fries, a dollar fry from the dollar menu. I said, Caden, you think we need to bless this man? He said, yes, daddy. And so I reached in and I pulled out $40. That's all I had in my wallet. And I gave it to Caden. I said, Pally, if the Lord has put this on your heart, then I want you to go in and give it to him. And I just sat back as I watched my four-year-old son walk up and hand to this man. And this man turned around and just began to weep. And all $40, he bought food for his family, bags, that he carried out to his family. I didn't take the time to get to know this man's needs. How guilty are each and every one of us of assigning value to those outside of our comfort zone 
or even those within our comfort zone. We look at relationships and we say, well, if they weren't so stupid, they wouldn't have made that decision. They made their bed, let them lie in it. Have you heard that before? Now, I, I want to make a, a distinction here. I do not believe that as followers of Jesus, we are called to enable poor behavior. There are margins and boundaries that we see consistent throughout Scripture. What I'm talking about is those that are truly in need. But the only way that you can determine someone's need is if you actually get to know them. And the Word of God calls us to actually get to know them. Do you know that the Bible says, going all the way back to Hebrews chapter 1, that when we care for the needs of the least of these, we are actually entertaining angels. The world says disregard any godly authority. It's all relative truth, isn't it? You can have your opinion, I'll have mine. You can read scripture the way you want to read it, and I'll read it the way I want to read it. We should all be able to read scripture and just glean whatever we want out of it, right? Well, that's, that's what most churches in the country are teaching today. That there's this relative truth, and that you can look at the word of God as though it's a buffet, a la carte, and you just pick out of the scriptures what you want it to say, and you build entire theologies that will actually land you in hell around that. It's not popular to treat, to, to, to treat the word of God as perfect, entire, complete, inerrant, flawless, and active and alive today. It's not popular to get up here and teach every dot and tittle. Those are Hebrew terms, which means complete and entire. But it's the only thing that saves is active, true pursuit of Jesus, him and him alone. And so we should obey your spiritual leaders. And by the way, in the same way that I said last week, how do you see yourselves? If you didn't watch last week's message, I encourage you to do that. I talked about what we see in the mirror, having sober judgment of what we see, and then holding what we see in the mirror against what we see in the word of God. Hold the word of God over the mirror and use this as your filter. In the same way, every one of you should be using the word of God to filter every word that comes from this stage. Whether it's in a song or it's in a message by me or one of our pastoral staff members or one of our elders or one of my friends that comes and preaches. That is why it's so critical to bring your Bibles I've said it 10 times in the last six months. I'm going to say it again. I promise you, sometime I'm going to preach a message from the book of Second Hesitations. And you're just going to sit there and you're going to say, oh, man, Pastor, that is so good. <laughs> All right, back to, uh, back to this is the patterns of the world compared to the behaviors of a Christ follower. Now let's go back and let's start in 1 Samuel 15 again, beginning in verse 24 from the top. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I've sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. For I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. He found his value and he made his basis for life consistent and contingent on the opinions and attitudes of the world. And what did we just see in Hebrews 13 about the patterns and the behaviors of the world? Look at how 12 of those characteristics are that deadly and detrimental. This is what happens. This is why I've entitled the message volatile value. Volatile value. When what we value are things that are volatile, we will end up empty. And so he goes on in verse 25. But now, please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. And so there's two things that we're going to discover here. Number one, he says, please forgive my sin. It is not Samuel's responsibility. Yes, he's prophet. Yes, he's priest. And yes, he's judge. But, but reconciliation and absolution is reserved for one and alone. That is the work of God in him alone. What, what Saul is looking for is absolution, not restoration. He just wants to be absolved from his sins. Did you know that there are entire religions the world over that you can actually pay to be absolved of your wrongdoing? That's a sweet deal. I throw money away on a lot worse things, including the stock market now, just not Ford. I mean, we waste money all the time. What's a few dollars in the coffers if I can be absolved from my sin? You mean I can go live my life the way I want to live my life and just pay to be absolved? And posthumous, posthumous did you know that, that when somebody dies, there are actual religions in this world that believe that you can pay to pull your loved ones out from the pits of hell and into glory? What? What? 
Saul is looking for absolution. He's not looking for reconciliation. What we're called to is reconciliation with our great God. What he wants is to be absolved of his wrongdoing. And the second thing is he says, come back with me. We're going to talk about that in a second, but I want you to pay attention to that. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Verse 26, but Samuel replied, I will not go back with you. Since you have rejected the Lord's command, he's rejected you as king of Israel. You're going to start to see a word picture unfold before your eyes. Imagery is huge in this culture and context. That's why Jesus preaches more than half of everything he says in parables. These word pictures are profound and they are intended to meet you where you're at and pull you into where God wants you to go. And so Saul, Saul saying, come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel says, look, in the same way that you rejected the Lord, he's rejecting you. And the word picture continues to unfold before our eyes. Verse 27, as Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe, his priestly garment, and Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. Do you see how this word picture continues to evolve, continues to unfold? He's holding on, he's clinging to the things that he wants, the desires of this world. He wants absolution and he's worried about his reputation. And Samuel says, look, because you're fixated and focused on the wrong things, God has pulled his anointing off of you. You will no longer serve as king over Israel. In fact, he's going to appoint one who is greater than you. He's a better person than you. We know him to be one as a one who is after God's own heart. We'll learn about that in the coming weeks. Verse 29. He says, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and has given it to someone else, one who's better than you. Verse 29. And he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. Saul is a man who is compelled by, vol by volatile value. From the time we meet him, when he is introduced, what does he say of himself? He self-deprecates. Uh, my dad is Kish. I'm a Benjamite. We're of the tribe of Benjamin, of Israel. We're the, we're the smallest tribe in all of Israel. Who am I that the Lord should use me? And yet he moves. We see this, this transition of self-deprecation to now self-glorification. Where was he last week? He was building a monument to himself in Carmel. That's a far stretch. That's a far reach. That's a far cry from a guy who says, I've got nothing to offer God to. I am greater than God. That's how dangerous following the patterns of this world is. God was able to use him in his humility. God was able to use him in his lack of value according to the standards of the world. God was able to use him in his willingness to be used by God. But as he begins to think more highly of himself and take on this savior sentiment about himself, building, erecting these monuments of himself so that all the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations as they pass through can see and observe and glory in and worship Saul. God strips him of his self. The Bible says pride comes before a fall. Pride comes before a fall. Saul changes his mind over and over and over again. Because of people's opinions, because of advice, because of the cultures surrounding Israel, because he looked longingly at the other nations and what they had, and he wanted to emulate what they had. So he began to change his leadership. He began to change his nature. He began to change his style. Listen, and this is not reserved for Saul alone. I deal with this and you deal with this. This last week, the same friend that I met with to talk about stocks and bonds, he made this statement to me. He said, Andrew, I want to talk to you. He said, I want to talk about how I see you interact when you're in large groups of people versus when we're one-on-one. -on -one. And I said, unpack that for me. He said, I don't know if it's being new to Blair. And he's known me all five years I've been here. He said, I just, I've watched you change since you've been here. And it's been amazing to watch you settle into who God has you to be in this context, in this culture of your life. So when you first came in, you were loud and gregarious and looked like you had something to prove to the world. Can I be honest with you? When I first came in, I felt like I had everything to prove to the world. And so I went around 
trying to be who I thought you wanted me to be and the people of our community wanted me to be and who my wife wanted me to be and who my children wanted me to be and who my staff wanted me to be and who my family in Oregon wanted me to be. You see how exhausting that is? And he said, I just want you to know that I've, I've absolutely come to love who you are. And it's fun to see, it's fun to see you just being consistent. Do you know what, do you know what a weight has been lifted off my shoulders over the last couple of years when I've learned to settle in to who I am in Christ and not what you think about me? Am I alone in this? I mean, do you struggle with this at work? Do you struggle with this at home? Do you struggle with this on social media? That is one of the biggest dangers of social media. It is a lie and a facade. I mean that with all my heart. You, you put on the best images you've got of yourselves on social media so that everybody can celebrate how amazing you are and how amazing your children are. And I'm not, I, listen, I am not throwing stones at you. That's what I did. I, ne- I wasn't real on social media. I, I'll tell you what, I was self-righteous. I was pious. I, 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 I preached many sermons on memes. I shared bold opinions. And I bragged about my family at nauseum. You don't care about my 105-pound purebred lab, though you should. <laughs> you don't care about this eight-point atypical buck that my son shot. You don't care about what I had for lunch. I was told this week, do not talk about food at the 11 o'clock service. I swear to you. Last week, I got into a whole thing about Chinese food and <laughs> crab rangoons. And <laughs> this is what happens. When we listen to the, the voices of the world, is our lives are volatile at best. Even the people that are closest to us, the people that we think love us the most, when we disappoint them, not if, when we disappoint them, we say something we shouldn't have said or do something we shouldn't have did, or we don't meet a superimposed unmet expectation that was never spoken, by the way, their opinions of us change. And the Bible calls it like a shifting shadow. We change. Friends, this is the danger of chasing long after the ways of the world. And so Samuel says, look, verse 29, and who is God? The glory of Israel. He will not lie, nor will he change his mind. For he is not human that he should change his mind. What does Hebrews 13, 8 say? That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the ways of the world will change. Trends will come and go. My son wishes I would have saved every single thing I wore in middle school because it's back. <laughs> I'm even starting to see the girls do their hair the way, I mean, I can't imagine. I'm going to start investing in aerosol. <laughs> I'm talking about like the way. I walked in the bathroom the other day and my daughter's doing her hair and I can't breathe. It feels like a gas I'm like, what is happening right now? She said, oh, it's just a little squirt. So that's a squirt? My lungs are sticky. <laughs> little squirt. Good Lord almighty heaven and earth. We change. We change the way we dress because of what people think and say and what we see on, on, on magazines and all over the world. We change what we, we, change what we sound like. And Samuel says, there is one who never changes. He doesn't change his mind for he is not human that he should change his mind because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can't trust the things of the world, but there is one in whom we can put all of our trust and his name is Jesus. Where are you putting your trust today, friends? Then, Sam, then Saul pleaded again, I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Even in worship, it was all about him. This is the second time Saul says this, come back with me, come back with me. His reputation was on the line. The people of Israel cared about what the man of God had to say. The people of Israel cared about what the man of God did, what the man of God preached, what the man of God presented, and it would have been 
absolutely devastating for Saul to show back up. Remember, he's on the battlefield. They've just annihilated the Amalekites. This is all going on. And so on the battlefield, they're getting ready to go back as victors before the nation of Israel. And what Saul says is, look, I want to be absolved from my sins. I'm not concerned about reconciliation, just absolution. And I'm, car I'm caring so much about my reputation that I need you to come back with me. What people see about me is what matters more than who I really am. Come on, come on, Samuel, just come with me, please. Don't you care about what people say about me and think about me? He doesn't want to go to God because he wants to worship God. He wants to go to God because of the way that it looks. It's good business. It's a spiritual LinkedIn. It's good networking. The people will be impressed that the man of God comes and supports me. They'll trust me. They'll follow me. He's so fixated and focused on the things that don't matter that he's blind to the fact that everything around him is being stripped away. I have a really good friend of mine who says, Andrew, don't ever confuse an argument with facts. Emotion always wins. Don't confuse an argument with facts. People just want to be right. They just want to be right. They just want to win. They just want what's best for them, even if it's not what's best for them. And we look at this and we say, how broken is this that even in your worship, all you care about is how people see you, where people see you, and what people see you doing. But it should serve as a stark, strong reminder for each and every one of us of how we see worship and why we worship. Why do you come to worship? What are your motives? What are your intentions? And what are your desires? Are you here with an active pursuit of the Holy Spirit so that each one of us can encounter Jesus and our lives can be changed forever? Or are you here to be entertained? Are you here to get spoon fed? Are you here to, to appease someone in your life? Are you here for absolution? Let me be clear on this. I don't care why you're here. I'm glad you're here. But my only goal and desire while you're here is that you encounter Jesus and your life is changed forever. That's it. That's my only goal. And as a church, that is the only reason that we exist. Now we're going to get creative in how we help people encounter Jesus. Like pack the park. Camp Refuge, Vacation Bible School. We're going to get creative and we're going to do what we can to reach people where they're at and introduce them to Jesus so that their lives will be changed forever. But make no mistake about it, that's why we exist as a church, to be a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever. Now look at this, verse, verse 33, super curious. Samuel said his... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go all the way back up to verse 30. And then Saul pleaded again, I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel finally agreed and went back with him. And Saul worshiped the Lord. And I just wonder if this is Samuel relenting because he cares so deeply about his relationship. Verse 32, the work isn't over. Then Samuel said, bring King Agag to me. Agag arrived full of hope, for he thought, surely the worst is over, and I've been spared. But Samuel said, as your sword has killed the sons of many mothers, and now your mother will be childless. And Samuel, the priest, the prophet, and the judge, cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Not before the people, not before Saul, but before the Lord. Then Samuel went home to Ramah, and Saul returned to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king over Israel. There are two things that I want to bring to your attention as we wrap up our time together today. Number one, I want to talk about God's promises and our place in those. What does Hebrews 13.8 say about Jesus? That he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he can't change his mind. That his word, his will, and his way are perfect. And if that's the case... What did he ask of Saul to do? He said, I want you to annihilate the Amalekites. This is a people that have intentionally and proactively sinned against me. 
by sinning against my people. And so I want you to cut them off from the earth. Sheep, cattle, goats, men, women, children, all of it. I want it gone. I want it wiped out. I'm going to fulfill my word, my promise that I made to Moses and Aaron. As they were coming out of Egypt and following my leadership and they were brutally assaulted, I promised them that this would come to pass. Well, guess what, friends? God's word does come to pass through the prophet Samuel. The initial assignment was for Saul, but because Saul chose to go after the ways of the world, he missed out on the moment that became a God movement. And God chose to use somebody else. God will have his way. Make no mistake about it. God can have an assignment in your life. And here's the thing. You have human responsibility and free will. You have volition. You have the ability to act under your own power and authority, either in alignment with the word of God, the work of God, the will of God, and the way of God, or on your own. But here's what I know to be true of the Hebrews 13, 8 God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, is if you don't do what God is calling you to do, you and I miss out on the blessings while he uses somebody else to accomplish his task. What is God calling you to do today that you might be missing out on because you're not walking in absolute obedience? Who is God using instead of you? That should stir up in your heart. That should stir up in your inner being, this, this innermost place, the quietest place of your being. There should be this fire, this anisopirio that is stirred up inside of you that makes you want to move to say, God, I know you're going to accomplish your word, your will, and your way, and so let it be with me. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you call me to go. I'll be who you've called me to be. But so often we look at what we, what we define and describe as the sacrifice that it'll take to get there. Is it really a sacrifice? Is it really a sacrifice? Can you take that car with you to heaven? Can you take that home with you to heaven? Can you take that overtime home with you to heaven? Can you take those hobbies home with you to heaven? Can you take those toys home with you to heaven? So we look at these things that we think will be a sacrifice in such a short, minuscule amount of time when compared to eternity, and we end up missing out on these moments and movements by God where he moves through somebody else because we've been consumed by the ways of this world. We cannot settle for volatile value. We need to find our value in Christ and Him alone. In Him alone. And when you find your value in Him alone, you are no longer volatile, but you walk out of absolute security and obedience. And sometimes you don't understand. Isaiah 55, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, so declares the Lord. It's not our jobs to figure it out. It is our jobs to be obedient to what he's calling us to. Maybe he's calling you to take a risk and leave that job that you've been in and, 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 and do that next thing that he's got for you. But you're looking at that consistent paycheck. Even though you're compromising your convictions and what the word of God says, you're looking at it and saying, but this is, this is so stable. Is it? What about the relationship, that friendship that you're holding on to? Is it glorifying God? And if it's not, what are you, what are you responsible for? What about, what about the mission field? Make no mistake about it. Every one of us is called to be missionaries. Not every one of us is called to go to Uganda or to Dominican Republic or to Ireland or wherever you would go on an international mission trip. But every one of us is called to be a missionary. Teacher, tell me, what are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. Are you a missionary in your neighborhood? Do you know your neighbors? Do they know that you know them and that you love them and that you care about them and that you're praying for them? And here's what I want to leave us with. Here's this final thought. It, here it is again. Here it is again. Notice how Samuel responds to Saul's disobedience and recklessness. It says he never saw Samuel, or Saul, Samuel never saw Saul again. But do you know what he did? He continued to mourn over that broken relationship. He mourned over that man that was so consumed with absolution that he never pursued reconciliation with God. And my question to you, friend, is do you mourn those who are far from Jesus? Who are you mourning right now?
Where do you find your value? That's the question we should all wrestle with. Right now, the, the worship team is going to come out. They're going to join me on stage, and we're going to close our time together in reflection. And I want us to reflect on that question. Where do you find your value? If it's in anything this, this world has to offer, it's volatile at best. Our value must be found in Hebrews 13, 8, in the Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus never changes, his word, his will, and his ways never change, then you want to know what that value is? You study his word. Because if Jesus never changes, and this is entire and complete, then every single word that this declares about us in Jesus is true. May it be true of you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.